Greetings ladies and mandelgens and welcome to this narration of the book Introduction to Human Biology, taken from Reddit with the author's approval. If you're new to the series, there is a link down below for the playlist. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. It didn't take much coaxing to get the humans to agree. Even Azumi could hardly contain her excitement to get inside the equivalent of a Gundam. The hardest part was getting the boys away from the Vararia steel suit, named so after the company that created the very first model. Lusona gave them a little rundown on the specifics as fresh spacesuits were being made for them using a type of superior alien 3D printer. At least, as far as Jean-Francois could tell, that was the best explanation to what that he was told the machines were doing. Lusona had measured and gotten all of the measurements that she needed before beginning her small briefing. So we'll be doing a skirmish, a brawl scenario. This means that it's just a straight up fight. No objectives except for the last one standing. Weapons are tuned down so that we don't actually hurt ourselves or damage the steel suits too severely. What high weapons are available? Barry seemed to be taking this more serious than anything else at the academy up to this point. We are limited to lasers. Real games, however, have missiles, railguns, and melee. For defenses, a Type 7 plasma shield is the primary means of protection. A second layer of armor exists, but for skirmishes, we stop when there is an armor breach or the suit runs out of power. Lusona pointed out on the display the various components of the steel suit. Now, since we're not many, we'll be doing a 3 versus 3 with condensed rolls. Normally, a steel suit is crewed by a pilot, a shield operator, a gunner, and a spotter comms operator. Overseeing the squadron is also a commander. Since we're three, pilot, spotter become one position, while gunner and shield operator become another. A few questions. Jean-Francois raised his hand, hoping to ask before Lusona continued on. How do we pilot those? Also, you mentioned a shield operator, so shields are manual. Lusona changed the display, showing the inside of the steel suit. When you sit down in the seat, which is also being manufactured right now, You'll connect to the steel suit by a very tactile way. These suits are easily replaceable depending on the pilot's size. Your movements will be interpreted by the helmet that you'll wear and be sent to the actions of the steel suit. Hence, a human pilot should be able to pilot a Dwey Dunn steel suit, but you've had much more difficulty. If even able to, with a four-legged and wild steel suit, one for example, the shields are manually controlled by an operator in order to save energy. The operator activates them when they are needed. The laser requires a continuous stream to inflict damage, so you'll need to keep it focused on the enemy. What about the tail? remarked Aura. I don't think that should cause much issue. At worst, you won't be able to use it. We can maybe remove it if it causes trouble, but it helps for balance. Lusona looked behind the humans and waved. Oh good, they're here. The four turned around to look at whoever was approaching. A small black furry creature came into view, making small but quick steps that clicked on the hard metal floor. It wore some open vest and small shorts, a tiny tail swinging at the back. It almost appeared to be related to a sheep family of species, if not for its elongated face that seemed canine in nature. Moving alongside it, a blue alien that could be at best described as some kind of blob, or rather a slime, slid across the floor at the same pace. Izumi's eyes went wide as she saw the small furry creature. Without much warning, she got up and ran towards it, prompting the poor thing to backtrack and run in the other direction. It didn't get far, however, as Izumi's longer legs allowed her to snatch it up. Unhand me, you fell beast! It screamed as she held it tight to her chest, muttering to herself about how cute it was. That is my friend Smilriet. He's the pilot on the team. Introduced Lucerna. Can you, um, please let him go? Izumi relented and put the creature down, its clamped hooves tapping on the floor, making a small clang as she lowered it. Never in my life have I ever, it raged, murmuring under its breath as it got distance between Izumi and itself. Hello, Lasona, how are you today? asked the other creature. I'm good, thank you, Lycos. These are the new students. They're human. This is Barry, Laura, Izumi, and Jean-Francois, she said as she pointed them out for Lycos. The four of them greeted Lycus, using waves or bows. All right, so lastly, the skirmish location is on the flat surface you saw outside the dome. That is the top of the Tarmina station. 
at random a few metal plates will be raised, allowing for cover. Lusona closed the display and began walking towards the steel suit. Now for teams, I'll need a gunner for my team, and the other three will be able to use a backup steel suit. Avaton, I'm not gonna lie, it's rather inferior to Numidian, but we're just going to this match for fun and practice. Yeah, is your friend not playing? Mizumi was afraid that she had scared the other alien by her show of affection. Smurly it is, but not like us. Her kind, the Kusid, don't do well with these kind of environments. Usually, most species have certain positions they excel at for Steel Squadron, but hers simply don't use them. Uh, I would like to try take Gunner, proposed Barry. I've got a few guns back at home, and I played a bunch of shooters back in the day. Well, I'll be hunting a few times with my uncle. He used to work for Heckler and Cock, so I've had a chance to see a few guns. I think I should be the other gunner, added Laura. Jean-Francois and Izumi nodded their understanding. Izumi was next to speak. Well, I've never gotten my driver's license, so I don't think I'd be a good pilot. If you don't mind doing it, Jean-Francois. It's fine by me. I've often wondered about how virtual reality could go, and this seems a great moment to experience. Lucerna stopped in front of the Numidian, a dwaydon steel suit, and smiled. After hearing this short bit of history, she really wanted to see how well they'd do it a steel suit. The machine signaled that it had finished its job, and she walked over, retrieving four spacesuits for the humans. Let us suit up. In the dome, red lights flashed, indicating the beginning of a steel squadron match. Secondary dome projection projections became active, raising another partial dome around the main one. Out on the top of the station, large metallic plates were raised from the station structure, creating an artificial battlefield. Atop the dome, two small rooms occupy the topmost space. Giving a view of the full battlefield, Lusona sat in the top one, overlooking the entire station, and began readying herself for the match. As commander, she wouldn't have much to do in the skirmish like this, but in official games, she'd be analyzing the situation, formulating a plan, researching enemy steel suit capabilities, and communicating with her own steel suit. The elevator dinged, signaling that it had reached the floor, and someone exited it, his heavy footsteps reverberating through the floor. Hello, father. A short, tired grunt was all the reply as her father let himself down gently onto the soft floor cushions that surrounded the small room. The stable doors opened, letting out the first steel suit, the spare one that Jean-Francois was piloting. It moved rather clumsily and without any grace. He moved to the other end of the field, taking cover as they waited for the game to start. A few minutes later, giving time for the first team to choose position, the Namidian stepped out, gracefully moving to a good pace with the skillful piloting of its pilot, Smurliet. I'm still surprised that you managed to convince Smurliet to pilot for you. He is uh, pretty good, remarked her father. What are you playing against? He added after the pause. The son took a deep breath. The match was about to begin. The new students. The humans. Down in the lounge area of the dome, Xenos were getting ready for some entertainment as the Steel Squadron game was about to start. Many stopped what they were doing and headed to the windows in order to better see the match. Looks like the Dway Dunn stable is having a practice match. They'll need it if they hope to make the finals this year. Ha! <laughs> yeah, their performance last year was abysmal. I'm surprised they didn't lose their funding. The Avatar are pretty rough around the edges. You part it probably. Bet you five CNPC they don't even last five minutes. Ha! I'll take that bet. A high-pitched single note sound rang through the dome, indicating that the match was about to begin. Only one floor down from Lusona, Izumi was in a similar room to her enemy commander, able to see great distances and the entirety of the battlefield. Lysona had briefly mentioned that this was similar to being in orbit and having satellite assistance, granting a bird's eye view of the full battlefield to the commander. Testing, testing, uh, do you receive me? She spoke to the communication device in front of her. It was linked to the computer. Not unclear, came reply from Laura and John Francois. Okay, the match is starting. The enemy is at your nine o'clock, moving in your direction. It took a moment for John Francois to situate himself, turning around to change his position, 
getting a bit more used to the controls. He peeked from behind the metallic paddle and advanced as he saw no one. On the other side, moving much more fluidly, the Nemidian made its way towards its target with the assistance of its commander. Okay, stop. They're right on the other side of this panel. Maybe flank them? Izumi wasn't sure what they needed to do, but it sounded like the best move. Obviously, a role like commander would shine more during a bigger engagement. As a team began moving around to get the enemy's rear, Izumi was surprised by the enemy's movements. The Midian jumped up high, gaining height advantage on the backup steel suit. As soon as it landed next to the Avaton, the Nemidian began firing its laser weapon. To Jean-Francois's credit, he managed to react rapidly enough, dashing to the right while Laura activated the shields on the side receiving the laser fire. The damage was minimal, but helped put the Nemidian on the offensive. It kept it up, following the Avaton while its gunner tried to keep him in the laser lock. A fast-paced exchange followed, lasers striking the exterior armor briefly before shields fell in place cancelling the laser with a high-density plasma. The plasma shielding used more energy than the lasers, making defensive turtling a bad idea. Jean-Francois kept his steel suit in motion, trying to make Barry work harder to get a solid hits on him. The superior maneuverability of the Numidian meant that Laura had to work harder than Barry in order to keep the weapon focused. Jean-Francois darted behind some cover, buying some time. Izumi gave Numidian's position but there wasn't much that he could do with that information because Lucerna was also giving his position. He started getting more used to the Abaton's responses, his movements becoming slightly more fluid with time as he ran around, trying to let Laura get shots in while he focused on trying to be hard to hit. It was a mixed success. He was able to use the shields less, but Laura was missing more of his shots. Damn it! Stop moving so much, jean Frontier. Laura screamed as she switched the shields to the left arm, cancelling out the Midian's laser ever so briefly. I can't. If I don't try and dodge some of those, then we'll run out of power. jean Francois was at a loss at what to do. His machine was inferior to the enemy's, and his lack of familiarity with it did not help. He thought about rushing it, maybe catching it off guard and throwing it on the ground, but remembered that melee was off the table for the skirmish. The Avaton's energy reserves depleted mere moments later, the steel suit grinding down to a halt. Disappointed, Laura and Jean-Francois waited in the steel suit as it towed back to the hangar. Up above in the commander's post, Lissona's father stood up. Well, uh, that was a uh, tad underwhelming. He looked at the game statistics sheet as he scratched his chin. Although the, the Remedian gunner had a fairly good accuracy with 82% continuous laser uptime, that's a fair bit above the league average. You should look into adding him to the roster. Her father was right. She'd have to have Barry get into a team tomorrow. She had expected a good showing from the humans, but she was left more impressed than she initially thought. Even the gunner and the grand champion Enoir team, Veto only had an accuracy of 72% without using computer-assisted targeting. And you know what? I never even told them that there's computer-assisted targeting. Both gunners were simply using manual controls. She entered the elevator, leaving with a smug look on her face as her father blinked rapidly in visible disbelief. Down below, the spectators in the dome returned activities, having enjoyed the temporary entertainment. Hey, five minutes and twenty-eight seconds, you owe me five credits, jeered one of the Xenos. The other rolled its eight eyes and shook its head. Decidedly, that had been a bad wager. Back in the hangar, the pilots exited their steel suits while removing their helmets. It had been a short time, but rather strenuous activity. If Jean-Francois had to compare it to something human, he'd have said bumper cars on steroids. Lissona and Izumi had come down from the dome in order to meet up with the others. No, dang, sorry girls, I wish I'd be even better, Jean-Francois hung his head low. Hey, that was actually a fairly good first showing, Lissona said as she did her best smile. Yeah, it was a ton of fun, even if we wouldn't have won, added Barry. I might have to say this sport is better than hockey. If we had this on Earth, I'm sure it'd replace baseball as America's favorite pastime. La Sona is right. For the first time effort, it was pretty good. With some training, however, you could maybe make it into the lower division, Steel Scorpion League. Smurliant kept his distance from Azumi as he joined in the conversation. You got any water around here? 
That was pretty good work out, and I'm parched. Jean-Francois looked around, but saw only machines and tools. Lusona motioned for everyone to follow her. Oh, yeah. Let me buy you all a drink. At first, I was rather skeptical when she had mentioned drink, but were pleasantly surprised when they had sat down on the second level of the dome to find an actual bar-like area. Lusona ordered something called Setus, which she had explained was a juice of a hard shell fruit for all of them. You know... I'm really happy there's at least juice. I don't know how long I could have gone with just water. Jean-Francois returned to his drink, emptying it in a few quick gulps. I'm glad you like it. These ones are a bit expensive, though, so maybe don't get too used to them. They're only grown on a planet very far from here, so availability isn't very common. There are other types of juices that cost a lot less. Oh, yeah, how, how does money work for you guys? Like, uh, does every species have their own thing, or is there some kind of universal currency? Barry had put away his drink, focusing all of his attention on the sonar. It'll vary where you find yourself. Everyone except CNPC, which stands for Carbon Nanotube Plating Credit. But most also have their own currencies. Governments have agreed on a standard measurement for a plate of this material, whose value derives from being used in almost all space constructions of large scales due to the tensile strength. One CNPC is worth one thirty-one-th of a plate, but we don't actually carry those around. We have digital devices that store them. So it's a bit like when we used to have the gold standard. How rare are these carbon nanotubes? inquired Laura. They're uh, not rare. Uh, they're, they're useful. Speaking of money, however, Barry, there's something I'd like to discuss with you in private. Lissona got up beckoning Barry to follow her. The others began making small talk as the two of them left, occasionally looking at a replay of the match on the screen above their head. Well, I suppose we should find a way to earn some of those CNPC. I'm intrigued at what the exchange rate would be for euros, wondered Jean-Francois. Assuming that we can make this material likely high, but it'll depend on what the standard measurement is for a plate, added Laura. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. One species could be willing to pay a lot for something native to Earth. The trick will be finding out more about what every species wants and likes, Izumi said and stood up. But for today, I'm going to go and sleep. It's been a long one. Laura and Jean-Francois waved goodbye to Izumi as she walked towards the elevator. They waited a bit, but Lissona seemed to be having a rather long conversation with Mary, who was listening and not talking. Looking at his laptop, Jean-Francois realized that there were only seven odd hours before the start of the next class. Well, um, I suppose I could get going as well. Today was fun. I hope we get to do it again. He waved goodbye to Laura, heading to his room. End of story. Just a quick shout out to the T5 peeps. Bob the Dragon, Cat Crab Lobster, Data Magnet, Dark Machine, Bezik, Try Again 95, Feudic Yol, Astrea the Dreamer, Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Athelia, Meridian 117, and Jordan Buxmorm. Thank you very much. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.